And today we watched Hugo, made in 2011 by Martin Scorsese. I thought this was an awesome movie because it was gorgeous cinematography-wise, and it actually told a little bit about film history, which also awesome. So for people in this industry, it's like, okay, inspiration, let's get going making movies. Absolutely. A real quick uh, synopsis, and obviously don't give away any spoilers, but give us a quick synopsis of Hugo. Basically, it's about this orphan who lives inside a train station, and he meets this uh, this old man in a toy shop. An old man? Yes, a creaky old man in a toy <laughs> shop. That's crazy. And they all speak with British accents, despite the story being set in France, where I actually, <laughs> I actually lived there By for a couple of months yeah. studying abroad, so... You studied abroad? Yeah! <laughs> I studied it a was bangerang, yes. So, <laughs> back in the day when I was studying abroad in France, Speaking everybody with had British, British accents. accents. Everybody had a British accent. Wee oui, wee. Oui. All right. Wee wee. Okay, so so said an old in, man in steals his okay. notebook and he's got to get it back. And uh, you know he never got it back. Did he ever get did it he back? Ever notebook? He never got it back. No, he never no, got he it never back. Did. But yeah. he got better than the notebook. He got. An friendship. Autom- yeah, friendship and an automaton and, and rainbows magic. And, and <laughs> friendship and magic. And unicorns are on nice. the topic of ponies. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh gosh, let's not go there. Okay, so initially, um, as a young man whose father had passed away, that we, we get a little bit of hint of, right? Mm-hmm. And, and then um, his father leaves him um, a uh, magical item. Well, I wouldn't say magical, but it was. Uh, an uh, important item. And, and pronounce what what he left. An him. automaton. Oh, say that's four or five times away. Um, and, and the automaton, describe what that is? It's a kind of, it's a metal robot that looks like it came out of the Uncanny Valley, but has a lot of awesome mm. clockwork inside. So pretty much a clockwork-powered C-3PO looking small world dummy that this one yeah. is designed to write. <laughs> but it, it, it kind of reminds me of the small world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. But amazing detail in, in the, the, the gears and the mechanics of this of this um, and Tom, say it again? Automaton. Oh man, I still can't pronounce it's that. It's only a model. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So we follow this young boy on his journey and he, he comes upon a, um, a, um, a friend, right? Yes, a friend, uh, by way of this cranky old man. It's his uh, goddaughter, who right. is actually also an orphan, but which is funny, because this time the orphan who is living on the streets knew his parents better than the orphan who was living in a house with adults. Yeah, yeah, a little, little <laughs> Interesting odd, uh, twist. <laughs> yeah, exactly, a little more depth to it, for mm-hmm. sure. And um, initially they go on a, a journey to discover what what the purpose of the the father's last gift to his uh, son. Is. Now, was Hugo the name of, of our main character? Yes, right? yeah, that's of, his name. The gift of, of Hugo's father left behind for him. So that's what uh, initially it was. Now, um, um, the guard of the train station, uh, played by Sasha... Bar- Bar- Baron Cohen. Baron Cohen. Um, what was the significance of, uh, of his limp leg that he had? Well, they... You got it caught on a train. Oh, did? Oh, yes, okay. at the beginning, he oh, yeah. uh, his leg action brace got caught on a train. Nice. So it, you were outside, but it just kind of he was chasing Hugo, and he uh, <laughs> he got well, a little that too was close. Part of the, wait, yeah. he didn't lose it in the beginning of the film. I didn't. See no, it. he didn't lose his leg. He just hmm. had a brace on it. Yeah. Oh, but I yeah, but the brace got caught. You already yes. knew what happened. He it was from a war incident. Yeah. Yeah. But so I didn't really it? think it was that relevant to the plot, the brace in his leg. It was more like, that's just there. <laughs> there's, there's one thing that you're, you're, you're mis, um, not seeing. What gave, um, hit, the, so the, the, the train guard was a constant character in this film, and he was um, the, um, the uh, nemesis of, of, the, of, of Hugo, right? Yeah. Um, and, and one moment that the train guard was able to woo the heart of the young lady in the film was when they bonded over his injury and her brother that had died. So, so the, the fact that he had that injury, it was a minor, it was a minor payoff um, to win her heart. But, but um, it was there um, to soften her heart because really he was kind of a... Um, very nervous and kind of a dork trying to win that, that lady's heart most of the time. But when he finally was embarrassed about it getting stuck in that position, he quickly said, you know, um, uh, my, my leg was injured in the war, you know, no more questions. She actually warmed up to him and said, oh, wait, my brother, I lost my brother in the war. 
So, I mean, um, I, and I'm stretching on that um, connection for the writing, but outside outside of that that connection with the young lady, I, don't, I you know, I, you know, it did give the character an interesting walk, an interesting characteristic, which you always want to do with the characters. But that's my guess as to the payoff for that for that leg injury. You know, um, does anybody see that, or, or am I just blowing smoke? No, you yeah, have it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're like you're foolish. No, no, no. <laughs> so, um, one thing that was really interesting about this great film was was um well there's, there's there's basically like five five things you can do in filmmaking you know you have your picture you have your sound you have your um color templates and you know obviously you have the story and the acting um that that goes along and if you'll notice that the color templates in this film were orange blue orange and blue and and gray the um hugo had had those colors on his shirt the whole time mm. and and they the, in every shot 95 percent of the shot they had Orange and blue are, are blue and red, and there's a, s a hint of gray almost in every shot. If you, if you go through that, you'll see that director deliberately lit the film that way, and uh, it, it obviously adds mood and um, an emotional um, reaction to us as a viewer. Um, uh, the witness was that, was that right? Um, the witness with with Harrison Ford in it. Yeah. Where they really use a color template to to describe different um, parts in the film. This was really, and also oh, yeah. Moulin, so, Moulin Rouge did this, you know, with, did anybody see Moulin Rouge? Yep. I did not. Yeah, yeah, where they really work um, the color and, and the lighting and uh, to really get a mood for each each setting, you know, and this this really did a, a great job. I mean, every single shot had a little bit of blue, a little bit of red, and then we end the shot with, with the um, um, Hugo's friend. The automaton? Being, yeah, being yeah. all, be in all red. You know, and since I, I, I imagine if I uh, thought about more, there'd be more of a reason as, you know, the red symbolized hope or, or, or completion or so. I, I don't know yet because I'd have to really, all right, I'd have to read a book about it. <laughs> yeah. But, but, uh, but it was obvious the color template that they chose, you know, in, in the overall film. And as filmmakers, that's something we need to consider in our viz def stage. You know, what do we want our audience to feel? You know, because that's, that's, that's kind of the, the cheapest time to set up that stage of of using colors to give a response you know in, in the audience you know um the the great shot with them um, with him being on on the on the on that uh clock tower you know uh when he was on that ledge you know when he just escaped the guard mm -hmm. that was pretty much just gray and white did you guys notice that the the colors in that not so much it's kind of more focused on it is probably freezing out. Exactly, there. but yeah. the reason why though was because all of those colors were gray and white. Just, just not, and also it was nice, you know, down shots, you know, to, to mm -hmm. give us a sense of um, littlement of the character. But uh, but just imagine it, what it was like in three D. Oh dear gosh, yeah, yeah. this would have been a brilliant <laughs> film. It was. To, uh, uh, yeah, it was. Did you see it? In 3D? Yes. So, so tell I, uh, us about that experience. All right. So uh, my friend and I were the only people in the theater for this movie. Wow. Yeah, the marketing was not that great sure. and I'm surprised I even knew about it but mm -hmm. when it came time for me to pick the movie I'm like okay we're watching Hugo so I get in there and he's like dude you're such a hipster <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like just two people with yep. 3D glasses on <laughs> and it's like this movie's awesome and then we get to the point where we find out where Papa George is and uh, then I'm like dude I know who this guy is oh, wow. <laughs> because well, if you've read about yes him, yeah. I've read about George See, I didn't Mellier. know about him until this film yeah. Yeah, was... really no, no, no. Oh, I mean, I knew his work. But... And you're the one who notices you're the, that the color guy, of his you're shirt. You're the color and story guy. Is, uh... <laughs> it's just I don't know everything. I don't know everything. I don't know Right, I don't know everything. <laughs> so, so, did you read about... Uh, I'm sorry. Georges Méliès, yeah. Yeah, he said it so easily. They, they pronounce it Georges Méliès. I'm not sure what the original pronunciation okay. was because I, I was Mont not Mont alive yeah. back in uh, the... 19 and... Well, I, I had just like, turned like 75. I had just yeah. turned 75 during those years. So, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. was, no, but so you had read about George Mill Yes, Millier. in uh, art history class. And, oh, really? Wow, yeah, he's awesome art professor. History class. Yeah, wow. Professor DaCosta. He was nice, awesome. Nice, nice. And, and <laughs> what were some things that really stood out in your mind about this this uh, filmmaker? Um, just, were, were you a fan going into the film? Were you... Were you uh, I barely knew about him because mm -hmm. I just... Kind of glossed sure, over sure. art history. Yep, yep. Never much of a history buff. Sure, sure, I, sure. But you the are fact that buff. I knew he exists, yeah, I'm, I'm big guns. <laughs> nice, nice. Check it. Like for your viewers at home, just They're imagine. Impressive. Yeah. Like, By 23 inches is what it's I'm the rock. Yeah, it's yeah, like I got right. watermelons under my arm. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. <laughs>
Anyway, yes, I knew about him in passing, and the fact that I knew about him in passing in this movie with two people in it was like, yeah, what? I'm like a hipster among hipsters, probably, nice, for nice. knowing who this guy sure, is. Sure, sure. <laughs> well, describe the iconic scene that I'm, I'm sure everyone who, who has seen, you know, with, with uh, the, uh, um, describe that the scene. The man that... in the moon gets hit in the eye with a rocket full of girls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's a black well, actually, it wasn't. <laughs> Oh, they weren't it? full of girls. It was the 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 the. It was like a the aliens. No, it was the um, the professor, a, a professor dude, and and, and an assistant. It was sort of like it that's why he like knows a, the show. No, no, look at it. Look at it. Oh, what it was you? because the girls would celebrate the shooting of the gun. The shooting. Of, they were like the 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 cheerleaders. Okay. Uh-huh. And then when they came back, they were the cheerleaders okay, of the okay, whole thing. Okay. The girls that you see in this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I've actually never seen the original film of that, but that's such an iconic film. I mean, everyone who's ever looked at old film, that they always show that as as the classic standard for old old time film. You know, which uh, uh, you know is interesting. I'm pretty sure the art history book had a picture from that in there somewhere. Yeah. I, oh, I almost every art history book oh, yeah. has it. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. and he would actually him uh, he would him and a crew would. Um, uh, hand dye the films to make them color because they knew they can project them that way, you know. Um, uh, so it was a little further ahead than um, other companies that were doing it. This is like one of those films where you want to where you, where you want to um, research more about film history and then rewatch the film again to get the Easter eggs that the director oh, yeah, left for in sure. there. You know, like um, the Buster Keaton posters. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly, and, and the variety of, of uh, the different um, staging of. of um, was it Buster Keaton with the Yeah, Buster Keaton? no, it was uh, one um, when they were in the lobby just getting kicked out. There was a Buster Keaton in the nice, background. Nice, yeah. nice, nice. Yeah, it would be great to you know do a little um, research on, on film history and then go back and rewatch it because I imagine the director just put in a bunch of Easter eggs that you know at first glance you're like oh I don't recognize it I don't recognize it oh now I recognize it you know so yeah it would be uh, um, brilliant to um, to observe it. Um, now why did um. Why did Hugo move us so much, or, 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 or even George move us so much? Was there anything specific that, uh, that how, he, how he moved you emotionally in this film? Well, as an artist, thinking, like, thinking about being 70, 80 years old and mm. having all of your art destroyed, I know. it's oh. like, oh, God, you make 500 films uh-huh. and most of them are now heels and shoes, and mm-hmm. nobody knows who you are, and you, he, he thought... Everything he created was uh, just gone. Mm-hmm. You know, from, well, okay, from what I'm seeing like, here, the, the the movie is a is is a, is an awesome film, but part of it is fiction because a lot of that stuff didn't quite happen. They just wrote it into the film to make it look good. Well, to make the like story, the, good, but... yeah. Because, I mean, of course, the war effort and stuff. The, his his career had been declining. Um, prior to that, and most of it actually, there, there's, the story was that he um, he was sick and tired of competing with Edison because Edison was um, trying dick. to invent. Yeah, <laughs> well, Edison, Edison stole and tri- um, oh, yeah, well, you know, it, and you know, I look, he was he was a he he yeah, because every every time you turn around nowadays, the guy is vilified as a horrible person. But um, what what really was the deal was, you know, he's he's in competition with everybody else, and he had he had a film company. He really wanted, you know, he went to New Jersey to be the Hollywood. He was pissed when when producers and directors of film were moving over to this side of the country because the weather was better, the and uh, they they had twenty four, so they had better sun, better weather, better they, lighting, they, yeah, a hundred percent better conditions. lighting. The the how the the building that he used that that Georges Melies used in um, that was on his own property and uh, during the war, during the war it was used as a hospital um, but much of it got destroyed mm. so the that that whole thing happened so he he was getting older too so he just decided not to just keep doing the same work but he invented his own camera combination projector which was amazing oh yeah. Because having a um, making the the very same unit of uh, the 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 thing that creates the film and then turns it and then can project the film that's pretty cool and that was nothing nothing was done like that by anybody else he would purchase his own film in England and uh, and it was um, usually had had to be punched 
by whoever, because every, it was like back then, film didn't have any standard. Mm -hmm. So you had to punch it, you had to use your own methods for doing it. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the other things that he oh, yeah. did. Oh, yeah, um, yeah the, it, they're, they're very good, they're very, they're very, very good in the film about creating another story in the background, which is great mm -hmm. stuff. And, and uh, that's, that's how I saw it. You know. I, I love the uh, the tenacity that they show of some of these pioneers uh, filmmakers. Where, truth be told, is there really was no amazing guarantee of a, a livelihood in film at that time. They were doing it purely, hoping to sell. Uh, you know, he talked about having a little bit of success on the stage as, as a um, as a ma magician. So he obviously loved to entertain, but. Um, there was no success in knowing that if you're going to be able to make a living as a filmmaker. I mean, if it was he was, and because of that, describe describe the, his um, studio that uh, that they um, they showed in the film. What they had was this pretty much huge greenhouse looking building, mm -hmm. so they could get good lighting conditions, and then there would be enormous sets and actors running around in cost really elaborate costumes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they just do all the special effects using actual smoke and. Uh, Smoke and mirrors. Smoke and mirrors yeah. and water. <laughs> yeah. Dropping lobsters into fish tanks. Yeah. I mean, that was such a cool idea. I didn't even think of that. But that was... Yeah, the, the foreground being a fish tank, and then, then they're shooting the camera through the fish tank into that other planet, I guess, whatever planet they're on. Into the doing, background doing or the something. Thing. Yeah. yeah. That was they're... the one with the mermaids underwater. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and that's one thing that's kind of interesting. Like a lot of times, like when you um, learn about filmmakers who who they get started off, their earlier stuff is so creative and so they have to make it work. They don't have millions of dollars to to invest in these. Just throw money at things. And they don't have so, a computer with a yeah, button that says, just, "Okay, let's yeah, put some smoke here." Exactly. Exactly. It was, exactly. It was pretty so, much no after effects, pocket, but it was him discovering what could be done. Yeah. But a lot, of, you know, and the thing about movie making was. Uh, Magicians really fell in love with oh, it absolutely. because it was one of the first. I mean, you know, we have editing today, and I think you just you you uh, shed some light on it the other day when you posted something online about editing. Mm -hmm. But modern day editing all comes from that because no people when they did filmed, and you know, I always talk about the pacing when when uh, when they were doing films in that time period in the early 1900s and the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. Um, it was just amazing just to see anything move. So yeah. they would just roll a camera while in the background a train moves. Or oh something. yeah, the, the, the scene um, where they show the and, train coming out. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah and, pe and people really did get freaked about mm -hmm. that. And that's why people like him or um, um, uh, Little Nemo. Mm -hmm. um, Shit. Oh, um, uh, uh, will I will uh, no, not will uh, I. Windsor McKay. Windsor, Windsor McKay, McKay. Thank, thank you. You <laughs> <laughs> see, we only have the book over there. We're first yeah, right. Windsor McKay used the medium uh, for Gertie the dinosaur. Yeah, yeah. And and he created his own effects, and it was just pretty much out of, you know, just. And Gertie tap your foot three times. Yeah. Yeah. And he would time the everything, crowd and then goes he would have, wild. He would be in front of the stage, yeah. and then Gertie would grab him and put him on his head and stuff. That was the kind of things that these guys discovered from doing cuts, from doing, and it all. This is another thing. It all came from a mistake. Somebody was filming, uh, uh, I believe it was filming a trolley or filming a street scene in somewhere, in probably New York or something, and film camera jammed, and there was a trolley going by, and then it disappeared. <laughs> so they, that's what did the whole thing. They were like, "What the hell? This thing just." And then they realized that they could use that type of cutting to create the special effect. Interesting. That's why he would have the guys stand perfectly still while everything gets set up, take everything out, put everything back in, mm -hmm. and then have these guys continue their movement. Yeah. And hopefully everybody remembered their cue. Yeah. And hopefully the camera stayed in place. Well, they lost, yeah. Because <laughs> they didn't sandbag the camera down, you know. Yeah. It, it could move by just somebody walking by yeah. it. Yeah. Um, that the and, and a, a good great example is watching old episodes of uh, Sid and Marty Croft's Land of the Lost. <laughs> Everything goes back to Batman or Land of the Lost with Rich. It's always that's his go-to reference. Then. <laughs> and anyway, everything that you ever need to know needs to be found in Batman. Or in Land of the Lost, aka yeah. Richard Rich <laughs> So uh, No, no. It, it, and this film, it, it was, it made me excited to learn more about film history. Truth be told, because uh, there is a lot of it that you know I, I know bits and pieces. Obviously, more of the animation side of film history, but not of live action film history. You know, um, 
you were the one who told me about why Hollywood was really was originally named Hollywood Land. It was a real estate development. Yeah, that they, they just wanted people to move out here because of the light and the sun, so they convinced a bunch of filmmakers, hey, here's the best place to uh well, If you to go up films. the hill further, uh, I think, what is it, Fountain? or, Well, when you're, when you're at the bottom of the hill looking at that Hollywood sign, yep. you uh, go it's probably about three miles, four miles up. There's a, there's a literal brick wall, and there's a little plaque on it. You have to go, you got to drive through it. That's the private neighborhood that was there years and years ago. And it says it's dedicated to Hollywood land. That was the original mm -hmm. development. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, those, yeah, those houses are millions and millions of dollars. But um, you, and it was cool because I lived there for a couple of weeks when I came out here first yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it made sense why um, George's house was made of glass and stuff like that because it was based in London, right? Is that what they No, no, it was in France. Was it in France? In France? Mm -hmm. And so you needed all that light to develop the film. And it's amazing that what, how spoiled brats we are nowadays with filmmaking. I mean, literally, you know, we have a whole studio right in our computer. So, you know, we, a lot of the suffering of the early Yeah, ages. we don't have to lug around our giant costumes and lobsters. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Well, this, this film is like the, uh, the, the polar opposite. Yeah. Because... It, it's done completely, it's almost entirely rendered. This film is almost no, it has almost That train all station sets. doesn't actually exist. What? Yeah, it's Mule based magic? off... Based off of, like, maybe three different train stations, one of which the Musée d'Orsay was actually converted into a museum. So if you're ever in France, you should go check it out. Okay. Because okay. it's... I don't even like museums, but I like this one. All right, all right, all right. Yeah. Like the Louvre, there are pictures of me on Facebook passed out in the middle of the Louvre because I'm bored. Oh, man. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the like... Musée d'Orsay was pretty awesome. Yeah, it's got yeah. a later art than the Louvre, but earlier than the Centre Pompidou. Interesting. So, uh, <laughs> I think I have fluent these names. I'll be like, yeah. yeah. Um, so if, if you were to yeah. meet some Joe Bob on the street and they asked you, should I go see Hugo or not, what, how would you sell them on seeing this film? What, what, would, what would you tell them? It'll make you believe in movie magic.